Pushkin. There's a place in our world where the known things go. A corridor of the mind, lined with shelves, cluttered with proof. Inside that place, behind another, darker door, is our morgue. Not that kind of morgue. Our morgue is a collection of evidence. Detectives used to have morgues where they'd keep files on old cases. Newspapers kept morgues, too, where they mainly stored old research notes. The Last Archives morgue is where we put stuff we've killed. Stories we liked a lot but couldn't use because the facts didn't check. There were lies, fakes, hoaxes. We couldn't use this stuff in season one, which was about truth. But in this season, season two, all bets are off. Because this season is about doubt. Welcome to the last archive. Welcome to our vault of fakes. I'm Jill Lepore. We've got a nifty old radio in here. Listen. Yeah. I can't see anybody. Who's that? I am the shadow. <laughs> Ooh, 1930s radio is so good. But also so over the top. Turn the radio dial to the 1930s. And be skeptical. Be very, very skeptical. Yes, here's the man whose whole life is a constant worldwide hunt for facts. The man who makes his living by telling the truth. The man who knows the place is making news today. Yes, Bob Ripley has been there. Been in more than 200 countries. Traveled over a half million miles. Always seeking, always hunting for facts. Facts that put you right with him in a front row seat of world events. Believe It or Not was one of the most popular American radio programs of the 1930s. It had two conceits. First, it claimed that no one had traveled the world more widely than the host, Bob Ripley. And the second conceit... Believe it or not, it's true, says Bob Ripley. And here he is! It's easy to believe what voices tell you on the radio. Just like it's easy to believe stuff you read on the internet. But should you believe it? Or not? This episode, I'm going to play you a lot of radio. Because this episode is about the role of radio in the history of doubt. A few episodes this season are about radio. Listen to this stuff, but carefully. Me, I have to keep reminding myself because I find Ripley so fun to listen to. Don't have too much fun. Don't let your guard down. You're a historian, damn it. Still, even the ads are fun. Ladies and gentlemen, believe the evidence of your own eyes. Pell-Mell gives you visible proof of its advantage to smokers. Your eye tells why. Your eye tells why. Good Lord. One problem was, just by being on the radio in the 1930s, a thing sounded like news, or with the right copy and announcer, everything could be made to sound like news. After all, most people at the time got their news from the radio. Radio sounded so authoritative, so easy to believe. That raises for me a big question. What's the relationship between belief and doubt and democracy and the radio? If, as I tried to point out in the last episode, there's something of a conflict between majority rule and freedom of thought. What if the majority starts telling you what to think? Then radio is potentially pretty dangerous because radio is one way you can lose your sense of what's true and what's not and be really influenced by other people. Luckily, at the time, commentators raised this very same question. People are asking that question now, too, just about the Internet. So this episode, whenever I say the word radio, you can substitute in your head, the internet. Got it? It's sneaky, this episode. It's a metaphor. When radio started, no technology seemed more exciting. Don't take my word for it. Listen to the president of the Radio Corporation of America, RCA. If the future of our democracy depends upon the intelligence and cooperation of its citizens... Radio may contribute to its success more than any other single influence. Early radio stations were often based at universities. Remember when the internet was only at universities too? The earliest goal with each technology was to educate. Radio educated the people. 
and it also promoted democracy on shows like America's Town Meeting of the Air. The program staged these crazy, wonderful debates. This one aired in 1936. Hey, Cryer, what's the question tonight? The question? Will the machine dominate man? Will the machine dominate man? The machine does dominate man. No, the machine has improved living standards. The machine has given us leisure. Right, too much leisure. Down with the machine. No, just use it wisely. That's the thing to do. Will the machine dominate man? That's a great question. Every new communications technology, from the radio to the internet, upends both epistemology and politics. People thought radio was powerful enough to save democracy because it could help people know things for certain. But was it also powerful enough to destroy democracy? Did it also make people unknow things? One thing radio could do with more sophistication than could ever be done before was to fake stuff. Believe it or not. Believe It or Not is the great temple of radio truthiness and its host, Robert L. Ripley, the high priest. The first time you listen to it, you might think that it was a show about evidence, a little like The Last Archive, as if, believe it or not, we're trying to draw a line between what you can know and believe and what you can't. But the second time you listen to it, you begin to think, no, it's just mainly a joke. Figuring out what it really was requires learning a little about its host. Ripley was born in California in 1890. He had terrible teeth, so crooked that it made it difficult to talk. Eventually he got them fixed, but by then he was so famous for his crooked teeth that he only got them made slightly less crooked. When he was 18, he got a job with a newspaper in San Francisco drawing cartoons. A few years later, he moved to New York to work for another paper. One day, stumped for sports news, he drew a cartoon illustrating athletic firsts, like a guy who ran 100 yards backwards in 14 seconds. This was just at the end of the Great War. 16 million people died in that war. And then, when it was ending, 50 million people died in the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918. Wars and plagues unsettle knowledge. They unsettle everything. In 1922, after the war and the plague had ended and the world had opened up again, Ripley's newspaper decided to send him on the road to hunt down more unbelievable facts for a series called Ripley's Rambles Round the World. He went to Hawaii, Japan, China, the Philippines, and Singapore and cabled back reports about all the things he'd seen. He got crazy famous. After all that atrocity and devastation and suffering, Ripley showed Americans an unthreatening world, a reassuring, and even a ridiculous world, a very silly world. He published a best-selling book in 1929. In 1930, he started his own radio show. He started in short films. Well, if you want some hot news, the fact may be interesting that icebergs are hot, not cold. How amazing. Technically, this is true. There's some thermal energy thing. Not interestingly true, but narrowly true. That's the line Ripley most liked to walk. Everything he said was amazing. Everyone he met was incredible. Here he is, Mr. Clayton Bates, better known as Peg Lake. Ripley says that's a one-legged tap dancer dancing with a wooden leg. And it's true, Clayton Bates was a real guy, and he did have one leg, and he was a tap dancer. But on the radio, how could you know that this sound was really Clayton Bates? You couldn't. You just couldn't know. Wondering was at least half the fun of it. Ripley loved to cultivate doubt. We have thousands of sound effects here in the last archive, many of them made by a guy named Harry Jeanette Jr. Around the same time that Ripley was traveling the world hunting facts, Jeanette was traveling the country in an old black Studebaker, gathering sounds. Like this one, a gentle rainstorm. But does this sound like a thunderclap to you? Or could it be a shotgun blast, slowed way down? Radio opened up a whole new world, and a whole new world of fakery. 
You could fake more than just sound effects on the radio. You could fake people. The very first radio show ever serialized on American radio made its debut in 1928. This show is notorious. It's horrible. Campbell Soup bring you Amos and Andy. Amos and Andy was a minstrel show. Amos, it's Sunday again. Yeah, Sunday is right, and don't forget we is on the radio every Sunday, Andy, for a rinse soap. Two white guys pretending to be two black guys. Blackface. Early radio did this kind of thing all the time. The incomparable Charlie Chan. Not just blackface, but also yellowface. Charlie Chan humbly gives you a greeting and extends warm welcome. Sage has said, nature sometimes reveals deepest truths in wildest jokes. Inspector Chan, Charlie Chan, one of the most famous detectives of all time. A Chinese detective created by a white guy, a Harvard graduate from Ohio, Earl Deer Biggers. A friend of mine, Yunta Huang, a professor of English at the University of California, Santa Barbara, wrote an amazing book about the Charlie Chan franchise, the novels, the films, all of it. I called Huang up in Hong Kong. So maybe we could begin. I, I just wanted to hear a little bit about what drew you to, to Charlie Chan in the first place. Well, usually to um, friendly and gullible Americans, I would just say, well, he was my grandfather. And they would <laughs> usually say, oh, really? You know? <laughs> Speaking of gullibility and, you know. As a kid, Huang practiced his English by listening to the radio. I inherited a sort of a, 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 a battered transistor radio from my sister, who had inherited from my grandfather. You know, because in those years, there was no TV, and every Chinese household had a transistor radio. And I was playing with it. Um, and then one night, uh, you know, I turned the knob, you know, the dial up and down, up and down, and it came to a frequency. Uh, then uh, a, a man's voice came out. Uh, it's like, this is VOA, the voice of America, you know, broadcasting in special English. Years later, in the U.S., while studying for his Ph.D., Huang came across Charlie Chan the way you might in a mystery story. He picked up a book at an estate sale. He was hooked. He knew he wasn't supposed to love this stuff. He was supposed to be outraged by its racism. But he loved the playfulness, the goofiness, and also the truth to be found within the fake. He read all the books, he watched all the films, he listened to the radio plays. After each episode, toward the end, um, you know, they take a break, music, I guess, commercial, uh, and then Charlie Chan will come back and uh, the host will ask, you know, Mr. Chan, what do you, you know, what kind of Chinese uh, philosophy do you have for us? Just when we are giving up seeking, it's time to find Good night. Thank you. Chen has this fortune cookie wisdom, aphorisms, delivered with lots of gongs. In films, a lot of the Charlie Chan sayings, uh, most of them were really uh, either cooked up by Earl Dale Biggers himself or, you know, invented by um, young Hollywood uh, screenwriters getting high and trying to imagine what Chinese will say, right? <laughs> but these radio plays, they contain genuine quotes from Lao Tzu or Confucius and, and all that. And, and that's all like, wow, that's actually, you know, almost like the commercials they will play, right? So the, the Chinese, uh, huh. you know, gems, they are, they are real kind of commercials. Uh, yeah. uh, for, of course, for the radio play, but for, I don't know, for, for everything else. Uh, like a, the sort of like Confucianism as a radio spot, like as a series uh -huh. of jingles or something? Yes, uh -huh. yes. And uh, that's, so there's that's certain, really interesting. Yeah, there's certain naivete but earnestness about it, uh, which uh -huh. doesn't really always exist uh, in, uh, in the visual medium. Of course, this attempt at authenticity only went so far. Charlie Chan's fake Chinese accent is bad enough, but his actual Chinese... I listen very carefully. I would try to figure out whether it's Cantonese or Vietnamese or whatever. Uh, they're not. They just, it's not. It's, it's, it's not anything. Up. It's really made up gibberish. Yeah. 
So on American radio in the 1930s, you've got Ripley traveling the world for wonders, most of which are fake. You've got Amos and Andy, fake black men. And you've got Charlie Chan, a fake Chinese guy. There's a pattern here. Radio wasn't randomly fake. Radio was fake in a way that reflected the racial and national contortions of the age, which included Jim Crow segregation, the restriction of immigration from Asia, and the forced deportation of immigrants from Mexico. In 1924, Congress had passed the National Origins Act, which banned all immigration from Asia and restricted immigration from elsewhere through strict quotas. But the act created a carve-out for non-quota immigrants, which included Mexicans. Four days after the passage of the National Origins Act, Congress established the U.S. Border Patrol. It set up rules for crossing the southern border. You had to register and pass a literacy test and have proof of work. A few years later, new legislation would criminalize crossing the border without those documents. Believe it or not. On the radio, Mexico became exotic, the romantic land south of the border. Ripley went there to excavate its history for listeners back home. On one of my many interesting trips I've made through Mexico... I discovered a, believe it or not, about an ancient prophecy that led up to a great historical tragedy. Believe it or not, Mexico. But Mexicans didn't need Ripley to tell their stories. In the 1930s, there were a lot of other voices on the radio. And they weren't fake. When General Motors says that they aim to put everyone in an electric vehicle, they mean everyone. There is a whole new generation of people who will soon plug in their vehicles as naturally as they charge their phones, who will choose to emit optimism, not exhaust. They don't judge cars by the rev of an engine, but by the hum of progress. This is Generation E, united not by age, but by the desire for smart, clean, and safe to also be fun, easy, and powerful. And this power comes from Ultium, a revolutionary battery platform from General Motors that can charge fast, run long, and fit everyone. Which means that when it comes to electric vehicles, nobody will be left out. Welcome to a new generation that defies convention and redefines what power can be. The start button to our all-electric future has been pushed, and it's going to be a hell of a ride. Learn more about GM's commitment to an all-electric future at gm.com. Everybody in. We're making lower emission vehicles our priority. Reusable packaging, our priority. And carbon capture research to offset emissions, our priority. Because Earth is our priority. At FedEx, we know sustainability means a lot to you. And we feel the same way. Our goal is to be carbon neutral by 2040. We call it Priority Earth. FedEx, where now meets next. Llegué a tener una hora en la noche, es decir, dos horas en la mañana, de cuatro a seis, una hora de de doce a una, y luego otra de siete a ocho de la noche. That's Pedro Gonzalez, who started a radio show called Los Madrugadores, The Early Risers, in Los Angeles in 1929, the year after Amos and Andy debuted and a year before Believe It or Not. Gonzalez's local show came on at four in the morning when only workers were awake, farm laborers, fruit packing house workers. They were up early, getting ready for the day, listening to the radio and to the music, and the warmth, and the humor in Gonzalez's voice. In San Fernando, había empacadoras de limón, especialmente en donde trabajaban, yo creo, más de 500 señoritas y otros tantos jóvenes en el empaque, en la pizca, yo no sé qué. The tape I'm playing for you is Gonzalez's music, And his voice is taken from an oral history that he gave in Spanish. I'm playing it in Spanish without translation as a reminder that radio used to be really bilingual. For listeners who don't speak Spanish, I'll explain most of what he's saying, 
But hearing him in his own voice, in his own language, is important. The case is that these people who were so close to Burbank were so close to me, I was surprised to myself that I came to the house at 10 minutes to 4 o'clock, then at 4 o'clock, at 4 o'clock, at 4 o'clock, to open the station, and there were two or three trucks full of young people and young people who were waiting for them to enter. Then they always had a great public audience at that time. Pedro Gonzalez was born in 1895 in Chihuahua, Mexico. During the Mexican Revolution, he'd worked as a telegraph operator. He moved to Los Angeles when he was in his early 30s. He found his way to radio after he read a flyer looking for Spanish speakers who could write and sing jingles. Gonzalez got the job and then started his own company, making Spanish-language radio ads. Dolores Inez Casillas, another incredible scholar at UC Santa Barbara, writes about Gonzalez in her book, Sounds of Belonging. When radio came on the scene in the United States in general, it was seen as this coveted, luxurious radio set to own. But as it became cheaper, that's when more working class communities of color, immigrant communities gravitated towards it. Early Spanish language radio had to be picked up from transmitters across the border in Mexico. Sometimes people would broadcast illegally from their garages on the West Coast. You could hear anything, fortune tellers, preachers, uncensored smut, fake doctors spouting quackery. Listeners loved Gonzalez's Los Madrugadores, which was the first Spanish-language show broadcast in the United States. Once the Depression hit, it became harder for Mexican workers in California to find jobs. On his show, Gonzalez would find out where there was work. If he announced it on air, everyone would hear it. It was incredibly effective. It got so bosses looking for workers would just go to Gonzalez and ask him to spread the word. Then mensuales con ellos y y entonces les dijo que preguntándole qué anuncios, qué me aconsejas, dónde, qué me podrá anunciar para agarrar 200 hombres con hachas para que vayan a a talar. Quiero gente mexicana que trabaje. Le dijo Vizcar, no hombre, vete con Pedro J. González, pero este te Hombre, pero necesito 200. Te digo que ninguna estación es más escuchada que la de Pedro J. González. Unlike Ripley, who was mostly joshing you, Gonzalez was the real deal. You could trust him. It tied listeners together, so they felt that they weren't alone. So it gave a sense that it wasn't just this Mexican neighborhood or this side of a Mexican city. It gave a sense that they were part of this larger mass. And it gave a sense of power. You feel powerful when you listen to that. Casillas says that Gonzalez's favorite songs were rancheras and corridos, ballads. He wrote them himself and played them on the radio. So one of the most popular corridos during that time, he did not write this, but it was aired a lot, was called El Lava Platos, which is the dishwasher. And it's a song about a dishwasher, a Mexican immigrant, and how he spends his days being a dishwasher. But it was a number one song style in the United States. People were requesting that. And I think a lot of people will say, well, it's because, you know, pobre Mexicanos, they, they miss their patria, they miss their homeland. That's why they wanted to remember. But there's a listener letter in his files that says, I appreciated that song style because you helped us forget. You helped us forget what our existence was like here. And I really admire that, that he did that in sense of not just romanticizing what you left behind, but this realization of what your life is like right now. Life right now included the U.S. Border Control arresting tens of thousands of people and sending them to jail to await trial. Mexicans charged with immigration crimes filled prisons. Their sheer numbers led to a massive growth of the prison industry. Then there were the deportations started by President Hoover. In what were called repatriation drives, the U.S. government forcibly deported over a million people of Mexican descent. Most of them were U.S. citizens. Gonzalez helped people organize and resist. He could announce um, a meeting for a union, you know, downtown, And then two hours later, all these people would show up. 
he started giving people um, a heads up, like yesterday at this train station, people are being deported. The more Gonzalez spoke out against the deportation, the more the authorities hassled him. He later said that authorities started asking themselves, what if he incites a revolution here? ¿Qué les parece si este loco, así como es de valiente y atravesado, y luego villista, de los, de, telegrafista de Villa, de las confianzas de él, dice, se pone a decirles a todos los mexicanos, no nomás aquí, alcanzan a oírlo en Arizona, en Oklahoma, en Nuevo México y todos muchos estados, levántense con una botella de gasolina. The L.A. District Attorney ranted about Gonzalez, said he was a madman, said he was conspiring to burn down white people's houses, that sort of thing. Cada mexicano, donde quiera que esté, y empiecen a quemarles las casas a los americanos. Dice, ¿qué conflicto mundialmente nos hace no más por un loco desgraciado como este? Once the DA decided to go after Gonzalez, the authorities clearly had him under surveillance. Police arrested him for keeping his daughter home from school. It turned out she was taking care of her sick mother. Then they questioned him about picking up minors, young girls, which he had done, but they were friends of his daughter, and he'd picked them up to drive all of them to school. Eventually, in 1934, police trumped up charges of rape. Y resultó que de repente me viene a mí un, un exhorto que me presente a la corte, acusado de rape. During the trial, Gonzalez calmly smoked a cigar. His fans filled the courtroom. He was sure he'd be found innocent. Instead, he was found guilty and sentenced to 50 years in prison. He was sent to San Quentin. His radio listeners wrote him letters year after year. Y continuó mucha gente ayudando. They raised money for his defense. Years later, his accuser said that she'd lied, that the police had convinced her to accuse him of a crime he'd never committed. In 1940, after serving six years in San Quentin, Gonzalez was released on parole to Mexico. Fue una cosa repentina. Nomás me anunciaron que iba a salir en parole. Y de todos modos, pues yo saliendo no me importaba. Yo, yo sabía que iba a venir a México, ¿verdad? Y me preguntaron, sí, yo, yo quiero irme a México. He was driven to Union Station in L.A. to board a train to Mexico. He was met by a crowd. He stopped and sang one last song. So we haven't found any archived broadcasts. Have you ever heard any? Or I have not. I kind of like that you can't find it. I, <laughs> I, I have to. I'm almost like... I mean, of course, I want to listen to it today. Like every once in a while, Spanish language radio will hear about an ice sighting. And it's so incredibly hard to get that recorded. But that's part of its mystique and power is that you can't capture it. For a long time, radio had afforded that kind of freedom and power, creative and unregulated. Small local broadcasters like Gonzalez engaged in a conversation with their communities. As Inez Casillas reminded me, I mean, really reminded me, this kind of radio can sometimes save lives. For a group of people who are so uh, legally vulnerable, Radio becomes so important. And I actually just heard, and beginning teary because I just heard, um, reheard a show. It's amazing. And it's bilingual in Mixtec and Mexican indigenous language and Spanish. And you hear these immigrants like calling and they're so desperate and they're using fake names and they're doing all this stuff. And it reminds me like, this is why people go to radio. Like, you are desperate for help, for information, but you do not want to be identified. In the 1930s, a lot like today, it felt as if the world was collapsing in on itself. Radio could be a lifeboat in a swelling sea. But then, in that age of immigration restriction, authorities started to puncture the lifeboat. The government of California tried to ban Spanish from the airwaves. The federal government stepped in, too. In 1934, Congress established the Federal Communications Commission. One of its purposes was to regulate radio, 
to keep signals from interfering with one another, and also to keep radio from messing with the public's mind. Not least because psychologists had begun studying the effects of radio, a little worried about its incredible power. By then, there were twice as many radios in the United States as telephones, reaching an audience of 78 million people. Radio is an altogether novel medium of communication, preeminent as a means of social control and epical in its influence upon the mental horizons of men. Voices have a way of provoking curiosity, arousing a train of imagination. That's a young psychology professor named Hadley Cantrell. He ran the Institute for Propaganda Analysis, which aimed to help the intelligent citizen detect and analyze propaganda. Cantrell studied all kinds of propaganda, but radio most of all. In his laboratory, he and his colleague, Gordon Alport, conducted experiments with which they hoped to be able to determine what radio does to your mind. In one experiment, they'd have multiple people record a passage and then play that passage over a speaker to simulate a radio broadcast. Then the psychologists would ask listeners how they pictured the person speaking. How tall was that person? How old? What color was their skin? Here's what they found. Radio seemed to expand listeners' horizons. It could bring the whole world into your kitchen. But then weirdly, it also seemed to reinforce people's prejudices. I think some version of that was a consequence of suppressing voices, like Pedro Gonzalez's. When little local broadcasters got kicked off the airwaves, and more and more programming came from big networks in New York, the world that radio brought into your kitchen got smaller. You want to hear from foreigners? You could listen to Charlie Chan. But then, toward the end of the 1930s, it's almost as if you can hear this ha-ha fakery start to deflate as if someone just punched a big hole right in the middle of it. (laughs) It's crazy how much we have to pay for outdated, impersonal health care, and even crazier that we all just accept it. It's time to face facts. Health care is backwards. Luckily, there's forward a new approach to primary care that's surprisingly personal and refreshingly straightforward. Forward never makes you feel like just another patient. Backed by top-rated doctors and the latest tech, Forward gives you access to personalized care whenever you need it. Using in-depth genetic analysis and real-time blood work, Forward's top-rated doctors provide you with in-depth insights to better understand your genetics, mental, and physical health. They then create custom, easy-to-understand plans to help guide you to achieving long-term health. With Forward, you get unlimited in-person visits with your doctor and access to care anytime via the Forward app, all for one flat monthly fee. It's time to stop accepting backwards health care and start moving your health forward. Visit GoForward.com today to learn more. That's GoForward.com. No child comes into the world believing that one group is superior to another, but rather how we allocate societal resources, the cultural narratives that we hold, the kind of world that we create for kids of color is often very different for white kids, particularly here in the United States. That's Dr. Brian Smedley, co-founder and executive director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity. Dr. Smedley oversees several initiatives designed to improve opportunities for good health and undo the health consequences of racism. And these children see that. It's reflected in the inequities that we see across a range of different outcomes. And it's my firm belief that we are making progress toward helping people in this society understand the fallacy of race, but the reality of racism, and importantly, how destructive racism is for all of us. I'm Justin Beck, founder and CEO of Contact World. Listen to Contact World, the podcast on the iHeartRadio app or wherever you get your podcasts. Once again, it's curtain time. And tonight we offer the premiere of a fast-moving melodrama, a breathtaking love story. In the beginning, radio theater just meant theater on the radio. You were supposed to imagine that you were there in the theater, watching a play. Standing room only again tonight. The stage is set, and once more, we're ready for that magic moment in the theater. Curtain time. It's sort of like if I said, 
Listening to the last archive is the same as attending a lecture. That would just miss the point. This is not a lecture. Radio isn't a play without a stage set or a movie without pictures. It's something else. It's its own medium. Orson Welles understood that better than anyone. Good evening. We're starting off tonight with the best story of its kind ever written. With the federal government regulating radio, big broadcasters wanted to prove that they were responsible and didn't need minding. So they began writing a new kind of show, a sustaining program, edifying and without ads, meant to display their virtuous uses of broadcast licenses. Orson Welles started a sustaining program on CBS. It was called Mercury Theater on the Air. Wells said the point of his show wasn't to bring theater to radio, but to bring radio to the listener. It was a radio show, but it was also a show about radio, especially its most famous episode, The War of the Worlds. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's. You probably know this story, but I bet it sounds really different if you listen to it after having tuned into all sorts of other stuff on the dial. Ripley's Believe It or Not, Amos and Andy, Charlie Chan, and Pedro Gonzalez. On October 30th, 1938, on the brink of war in Europe, Orson Welles broadcast an episode about an alien invasion. It began as if it were any other evening's entertainment. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. From the Meridian Room in the Park Plaza Hotel in New York City, we bring you the music of Raymond Raquello and his orchestra. With the touch of the Spanish, Raymond Raquello leads off with La Compensita. Just another evening of exotic Spanish music on the radio. When suddenly that concert gets interrupted by news bulletins reporting that a strange object has fallen from space at a nearby farm. Listen to what Wells can do with sound effects. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips again, out at the Wilmot Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Here's Mr. Wilmot, owner of the farm here. Well, as I was saying, I was listening to the radio, kind of halfway. Yes, Mr. Wilmot, and then you saw something. I seen a kind of greenish streak and then zingo. Something smacked the ground, knocked me clear out of my chair. Well, were you frightened, Mr. Wilmot? Well, I ain't quite sure. I reckon I was... Kind of riled. Well, thank you, Mr. Wilmer. Thank you very much. Yeah, you want me to tell No, that's quite all right. That's plenty. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just... Our heard... frustrated correspondent has given up on the hopeless eyewitness when... Wait a minute. Something's happening. Hump shape is rising out of the pit. What's that? There's a jet of flame springing from the mirror and it leaps right at the advancing men. Oh, Lord, they're turning into flames. Ah! Oh, the whole field's caught up by the woods. The fires, the, the gas tank, tanks of the automobiles are spreading everywhere. It's coming this way now. Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. People fell for it. Or at least that's the legend. Because this production was so genius. Those layers of voices, announcer, reporter, eyewitness, aliens! Newspapers reported that Americans had collectively lost their minds. There were reports of jammed switchboards and frantic emergency calls. The Los Angeles Times reported two heart attacks and a stroke. All that panic, it might just have been newspapers trying to sell copies and maybe undermine people's faith in radio so they'd start reading the news again instead of listening to it. Then, too, it was a perfect story for psychologists like Hadley Cantrell, whose grant money depended on the idea that radio really could whip people up into a frenzy. Honestly, though, it's impossible to know whether or not there was a panic that day. And I think there's not all that much difference between a panic and a story about a panic There was plenty of that. One senator from Iowa called for a bill to prevent a broadcast like War of the Worlds from ever happening again. The next day, Wells tried to defend himself to the press. uh, You must realize that when I left the broadcast last night, I went into a dress rehearsal for a play that's opening in two days, and I've had almost no sleep. And I, I know less about this than you do. I haven't read the papers. Except okay, the the thing thing you had he was mobbed by reporters demanding answers. You think there ought to be a law uh, against such uh, enactments as we had last night? Or is, is it all of that? I don't know what the legislation would be. I know that almost everybody in radio would do almost anything to avert the kind of thing that has happened. Uh-huh. Myself included, but I, uh, I don't know what the legislation would be. We simply 
Radio is new, and we are learning about the effect it has on people. Over in Princeton, near where the aliens supposedly landed, Cantrell was floored by War of the Worlds. He couldn't have designed a better experiment if he'd wanted to. He thought it'd make a perfect study for the Institute for Propaganda Analysis. So he began pitching the idea, collecting news stories and data on the supposed panic. Meanwhile, his colleagues, Herta Herzog and Hazel Gaudet, began to do research and interviews, for which they don't receive nearly enough credit. They measured the size and nature of the thing, trying to figure out what made people fall for it. Here's some of what people said. I believed the broadcast as soon as I heard the professor from Princeton and the officials in Washington. I knew it was an awfully dangerous situation when all those military men were there and the Secretary of State spoke. If so many of these astronomers saw the explosions, they, they must have been real. They ought to know. Later, Wells changed his story. He said he'd known what he was doing all along, that he'd been trying to prove just what Cantrell suspected. People would believe anything they heard on the radio. That's a pretty terrifying conclusion, especially in the 1930s, with totalitarianism on the rise around the world. The trick in a democracy, in an age of mass communications, is to find a way out of doubt and into a set of rules of evidence that allow you to figure out what's true and what's not. So Americans got really interested in defending themselves against the radio and the way it can cultivate doubt, and also in using the radio to get Americans to believe in America and in the American experiment. In 1939, on CBS Radio, one year after Orson Welles' infamous broadcast, the celebrated concert artist Paul Robeson sang a new song, a new American anthem, about belief and doubt and the American creed. I think of it as the long-forgotten last act of War of the Worlds. Nobody who was anybody believed in Everybody who was anybody, they doubted it. Nobody had faith. Nobody, nobody but Washington, Tom Paine, Benjamin Franklin, Chaim Solomon, Christmas Alex, Lafayette, nobody. Ballad for Americans became Robeson's signature song. An American creed sung with more power and resonance, maybe, because it was sung by an African-American. The performance also made radio history. In the studio, the audience applauded for two minutes while the show was still on the air live, and then for 15 more minutes after the broadcast moved on. CBS's switchboards got jammed with callers wanting to hear it again. It was like a bizarro American corrido, all about truth and doubt. These truths of the Declaration of Independence, about how Nobody who was anybody believed it, and everybody who was anybody doubted it. Then there's the constant questioning by members of the chorus, asking who is telling the story, the nobody who believed in the idea of democracy. Oh, who are you, mister? Yeah, how come all this? Are you an American? Am I an American? I'm just an Irish, Negro, Jewish, Italian, French, and English, Spanish, Russian, Chinese, Polish, Scotch, Hungarian, Litvak, Swedish, Finnish, Canadian, Greek, and Turk, and Czech, and double-Czech American. It's a knockout, but it's also unsettling. How do you believe in something when it keeps disappointing you, failing to live up to its own ideals? The United States is an act of belief. You have to believe in its founding ideas for the thing to work. Somehow, you're supposed to suspend doubt. But then, what about its failures? Out of the cheating, out of the shouting, out of the murders and lynching, out of the windbags, the patriotic spouting, out of uncertainty and doubting... I have to say, I'm really moved by thinking about what it must have been like to live in the United States during the years when the country was preparing to enter the war in Europe. Years when radio kept trying to instill a belief in a renewed American creed. Not the creed of Thomas Jefferson, but a new creed. Inequality promised, if not realized. 
America in the 1930s, bread lines, starving children, vigilantes lynching people, and then the everyday humiliations of segregation. After performing Ballad for Americans on the radio, Robeson went out to eat with friends, but the restaurant refused to seat him. You can want to believe to believe in America, but you can't allow that will to believe to lead you to ignore its shortcomings. There are a lot of lies and liars and fakers. But not everything is a lie or a fake. The feeling that it's hard to know anything anymore, that happens every time a new technology of communications emerges. But the answer to a mess of lies can never be to doubt everything, because doubting it all means believing none of it, and having nothing left to believe in. Paul Robeson sang his American creed just weeks after war broke out in Europe, when Germany invaded Poland. During this all-too-real war of the worlds, radio began broadcasting a new kind of news, live eyewitness reporting from the scene of battle, announced by Edward R. Murrow, one of the greatest reporters of the 20th century. This is Trafalgar Square. The noise that you hear at the moment is the sound of the air raid siren. I'm standing here just on the steps of St. Martin's in the Fields. A searchlight just burst into action off in the distance. One single beam sweeping the sky above me now. That's not sound effects. That's not fake. That's the sound of war from the other side of the world. The bombing of London. Robert Ripley tried briefly, haplessly, to talk about the war, the real world. Bob, this week in Europe, they certainly have been making history, haven't they? Yes, Ford. This has been a week of astounding historical happenings. The map of Europe is being changed before our eyes. But that was no way to talk about atrocity. Ripley's heyday came to an end, on the radio anyway. 1939 marked the rise of a new style of radio, with the immediacy and intensity of eyewitness reporting and breaking news, a style that elevated a single voice, the voice of authority, the -the on-the-scene reporter. One of the strangest sounds one can hear in London these days, or rather these dark nights, just the sound of footsteps walking along the street, like ghosts shod with steel shoes. Radio collapsed distances. For the first time, Voices could come from anywhere and work their way through your ears, into your head, to the inside of your brain. Almost a century later, much of this seems to be happening all over again. The world unraveling, while the internet bounces off satellites high above and stomps along the corridors of your mind. Like ghosts, shod with steel shoes. The Last Archive is written and hosted by me, Jill Lepore. It's produced by Sophie Crane McKibben and Ben Nadefhaffrey. Our editor is Julia Barton, and our executive producer is Mia Lobel. Martine Gonzalez is our engineer. Fact checking by Amy Gaines. Original music by Matthias Bossy and John Evans of Stellwagen Symphonette. Our research assistants are Olivia Oldham and Oliver Riskin Kutz. Our foolproof players are Yoshi Amao, Raymond Blankenhorn, Matthias Bossi, Dan Epstein, Ethan Hershenfeld, Becca A. Lewis, Andrew Parella, Robert Ricotta, and Nick Saxton. The Last Archive is a production of Pushkin Industries. At Pushkin, thanks to Jacob Weisberg, Heather Fain, John Schnars, Carly Migliori, Christina Sullivan, Eric Sandler, Emily Rostick, Maggie Taylor, Maya Koenig, and Daniela Lacan. Many of our sound effects are from Harry Jeanette Jr. and the Star Jeanette Foundation. Special thanks to Simon Leake, Oliver Leake, and Paul Espinoza. If you like the show, please remember to rate, share, and review. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I'm Jill Lepore.